Everybody, this is Pat Windrow once again at the Cable Easel with a program which is devoted to painting and drawing from life. And I'm live tonight. That means that you can call. Uh, the number is 348-6800. Call on the phone and we can talk about uh, um, pr preferably what I'm doing. And if you have any questions about what I'm doing, then maybe we can just get some information passed along. Um, this evening, because even though it may be after the fact, Christmas having been four, four days ago or so, um, uh, this is a uh, Christmas tree. The lighting of Long Island's only public Christmas tree. It, it, this is Long Island's answer to Rockefeller Center. And, um, it's in Uniondale, which is, of course, um, in there on Hempstead Turnpike. And if you didn't get a chance to go there, this is the opportunity between now and the 6th of January when they're going to dismantle this amazing tree. It's amazing because it was grown right here on Long Island. It does not come from the Great Middle West, and it was not uh, chopped down in Canada, but it was taken down right here on Long Island. And it was planted uh, 43 years ago by a certain D Jean Di Gennaro, who is 79 years old, and he was there for this uh, tree lighting. Kind of an amazing story, and I think that you ought to know about it. So here, from this modest little program called The Cable Easel, you have learned something that you may not have known. It was probably in Newsday with a remarkable coverage, but I'm here to tell you a little bit about it and to kind of chat with you on the phone, preferably, and to do a painting of this. Uh, because that's what the show is about, painting. Um, uh, Christmas is come and gone. Some people are glad, some people are sad, and uh, most of the people are breathing a great sigh of relief. So I'm just prom promoting more anxiety by keeping the Christmas thing going today, uh, tonight. Um, I was in Riverhead earlier and um, met with some absolutely charming people at the uh, uh, Suffolk County Federal Savings Bank. I'll talk about them as, as time goes along, but let me do what I usually do, and that is to start out from scratch with a perfectly blank canvas and show you how I go about the composition of a painting. Uh, paintings must be composed, and uh, anybody who thinks that you can just start slapping paint on canvas uh, is going to have a very hard time of it. So planning is the point. The point of this painting is a Christmas tree. Therefore, I'm going to place it immediately in the, in, in the a little bit off center of the canvas, which is what you see on the monitor, and the, you find the center point of anything so that you can presumably get it vertical. Um, the Christmas tree is going to occupy approximately this much space on the canvas. Yeah, I'm just laying this out because this is the space that is, um, that is going to be required to render the tree. It was taken at dusk or in the very late afternoon, and um, the setting sun, uh, wonderfully enough, is being captured in the mirror uh, walls of this, uh, the office building uh, of the uh, EAB Plaza uh, in uh, Uniondale. Um, it is the tallest office building on Long Island. It is also a remarkably handsome building, uh, providing you can ever get your mind away from the, um, the turn of the century uh, hang up that we have about the beauty of buildings has got to be 19th century. And the beauty of buildings can be this century as well. So here we have a very simple plan. This is the corner building which is peeking out on the left. And here, this whole area here is going to be the backdrop for the Christmas tree. But uh, there is a shadow of another building that is being cast on this one, making it a rather surreal composition. Uh, you're not quite
quite sure what you're looking at, but uh, that's what makes for the mystery of things. And right over here in this area is going to be that great glowing sunset uh, in the building. So we're getting uh, lots of things for the price of one. We're getting uh, the portrait of the tallest office building on Long Island, and a Christmas tree celebrating the season, and then the miracle of all time, the setting sun, uh, which is taking place over that way, and what you're seeing is the reflection. So, not only do I try to present magic with painting, but I also come up with rather magical subjects. Uh, this shot was taken uh, last week. Uh, the tree lighting ceremony took place on December the 4th, and it's the 10th annual tree lighting ceremony at this particular place. The, the, the Matei Construction uh, co uh, Corporation or uh, Consortium of uh, Developers are the people who uh, have put up this uh, great plaza there in this, uh, you know, as close to New York an urban area as you can get. So, instead, while I, so I avoid boring you half to death, I'm going to start to apply paint to canvas and hope that what I'm doing is of interest enough so that you can call and we can talk. Um, I'm missing, mixing paint on the canvas, as I many, many times do, uh, for many, many reasons, but uh, we don't have to keep repeating those reasons all the time. It's just that it works rather well, and it avoids the need to carry uh, palettes if you're out there painting in the, uh, in the real world instead of here in the comfort of a studio. Here is the... Um, Time, of course, being very limited, one hour is not very much to, to talk and, 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 uh, and converse with you on the phone, but also to produce any kind of a painting, so I'm just going to get right to it and keep talking as I, as I work. Um, I'm applying the paint with a palette knife, it covers a large area and a very nice quick pace, pace, uh, moment in time, but you can also apply brush to smooth out the areas that you have applied, and it also thins the, um, thins the paint at the same time, giving you a, what you call a brush finish technique, as opposed to a very heavy impasto um, uh, palette knife technique. There is, the, uh, there is all you need to do about the sky. The um, background of the, uh, of the building, which is the building, is a, is a combination of uh, some white, some ultramarine blue. I'm mixing it right here on the canvas. And it's, quite, and it's gotten quite dark because the sun is setting. See, these tapes take about 20 or 25 minutes. And, they, and when, the, uh, when the sun sets, the sky becomes progressively darker, as do the buildings. Now, um, this, this uh, color over here is going to be the, the color of the building as it is up against the sky. Um, that's too dark, too dark, a little bit more. And uh, when it's too dark, you add some white. So. And there's also a touch of mauve in this, which is going to be accomplished by adding uh, a little dab of um, alizarin crimson mixed over here, and I'm going to apply this rather quickly because I want the paint to dry sufficiently so that I can use it as a background for the Christmas tree itself, which is going to be superimposed over it. Um, I work in layers, as you may have heard me say many, many times. You work from the background to the foreground, and um, uh, you layer things on top of one another. Oil paintings are the only thing, oils are the only things that allow you to do this. You don't do this with, um, with acrylics. Uh, you can, but it's less successful. And here is the uh, general uh, tone that you can catch on your monitor of the, of the uh, side of this building, uh, which is uh, just an enormous mirrored monolith of a thing. I don't know how they make these things, but they do. And um, it is a testimony to the ingenuity of American architecture that these things get put up uh, without too much uh, uh, beef from the public because the public uh, is still hung up on the idea that it's got to be made of stone and steel and brick and granite and uh, so forth. But um, these, uh, the new materials are uh, giving the world the opportunity to put up extremely imaginative and very handsome buildings. Um, I think when a handsome building in the 20th century, almost the 21st century, is handsome, it's going to last virtually as long as what you might call the classical architectured buildings. Now here, this area here that I'm doing is where the building turns. Uh, your monitor shows you that this is a building with a curved, uh, well, front or side, whichever it may be, and it is 
Uh, it is uh, slightly paler as it turns, and then it becomes dark again over as it as it goes into the shadow. So um, don't forget if you um, if you are interested at all, and we can you'd like to talk, uh, let's do it. This is the opportunity. I'm live only once a month when I come up here from Virginia, where I now live, and. Um, I, uh, I prepare, uh, sometimes I prepare a lot of things to do on the show down there, but most of the time it's all done up here because the point of this program is the local origination uh, of the cable network here at Channel One. We want to be able to uh, tap into the resources of, uh, of our environment here and um, to be able to take you on these uh, nice artistic tours of this most remarkable of places. Uh, even though where I come from is equally as remarkable, here we have an extraordinary variety of things which can interest even the most jaded and blasé uh, inhabitant. We have the water on both sides. We have some beautiful little corners and pockets of charm that are that are visible uh, in many many locations and then we also have the horrible traffic but uh, the good uh, comes with the bad and uh, the people who live here I think uh, realize that uh, one thing is well balanced by another what I've done here is to um, prepare while I'm talking to you, uh, the background for this uh, Christmas tree, which, uh, as I told you before, is a genuine native uh, planted by a native, native Long Islander, which is, to me, a, a rather remarkable story. Here is the, uh, here's the shadow of the other building, and I'm applying it with a rather large, heavy brush, uh, hoping that uh, all of this is going to make wonderful sense when it's over but in the meantime we're trying to I'm trying to do a lot of things at once I'm trying to give a lesson in composition painting history events and uh, and local um, intrigue so uh, I have uh, I have of course wear many hats on this on this program and 1993 has been a really uh, more, uh, gratify, very gratifying year um, the Cable Easel was nominated once again for an ACE award a nomination is uh, almost as good as a win and um, I, uh, I find myself uh, traveling a very long distance to come up here, but it's worth every minute because of the, uh, the mail that I get and the postcards and the people who like what I'm doing. Here is going to come the great glow of that sunset that I talked about before that is reflected in the, in the uh, side of the building. And in order to do that, I'm going to take this palette knife, which has got blue on it, and I'll show you the, the wonders of the palette knife, that with the swipe of a, of a paper towel, it becomes pristine and shiny clean with just two swipes, something that you cannot do with a brush. So the palette knife affords a nice a clean look to just about uh, everything that one does with oil paints that tend sometimes anybody who's tried this knows that it's a messy uh, a, a messy medium here is the basic tone of this sunset it's very it's almost white but it's really actually a little bit of yellow white and very subtly I'm going to take a perfectly clean brush I think it's clean and I'm going to start working in a touch of the um, of the greenish and the yellow and the orange that that sunset is uh, is doing in this building. I hope that this glow will work because well you never can tell you 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 put your best foot forward and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but um, because things uh, usually take longer than you expect them to especially in oil painting so uh, if you see that I'm having to go back over something it's because I've had to wait for the paint to set to dry to behave the way I want it to a touch of the orange is going to show that the glow of this sunset and that's always great fun to see this kind of thing happen. I hope that the monitor is picking up all this, uh, these very subtle color changes. And um, if it doesn't, whenever we have an Art for Open Land show, you'll be able to come and see this, this little uh, work uh, in person. Sometimes it looks much better on the video than it does in person, and then other times it looks pretty good here. Um, the, uh, the Christmas season, of course, is a frantic, hysterical, and, uh, and sometimes extremely exhausting uh, holiday. I have uh, become extremely wise in these uh, years uh, that I have lived this long to be able to relax and not let Christmas get to me. So 
uh, that's why I'm in, uh, perfectly willing to uh, do this rehash of the Christmas season here with this uh, uh, three days uh, late a painting of the uh, of this tree. There was a lot going on that day. Uh, oh, I don't know, a, 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 a toy train ride, and there were dancers and choruses and choirs of uh, children and adults singing carols and so on. So it was an extraordinary event to which I believe somewhere around 25,000 people gathered to witness it. Uh, and that's uh, that's well, that's a pretty big mess of people. I'm glad I didn't have to worry about parking there. But they tried to attend to all of that uh, with parking in other places. However, you can still see it. You can go there. It's uh, just uh, east of here by a number of miles and um, in the general vicinity of Hempstead. Uh, and um, there you have it. Uniondale, New York is where it's at. And um, boy, these banks, when they want to promote themselves, they certainly have the resources and the imagination to, to do it. Well, here we have a glow. So hopefully that's the glow of the building. There's probably going to be, have to be a lot more added before the show is over because the building becomes a wonderful sort of a turquoise. And I'm going to add some, a little bit more uh, orange down here. And uh, then there's a great deal of darkness uh, down below here, which is where the, um, uh, the silhouetting and the reflections in the building take place. And as soon as you apply this extremely dark tone next to the um, very pale one, you're going to immediately get a very a much shinier and much more reflected uh, look about, the, um, about that uh, mirrored sunset I in the building. Uh, there, there you have the side of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the other building uh, reflected. And, and of course, this building, for some reason or other, has got these nice little um, semi-circles uh, uh, reflected on the glass. Um, when I do these things, I often say to myself, there has to be some artistic merit to this. And, uh, and I believe that the art artistic merit is the optical illusions that are taking place. And I like to deal in optical illusions. I do a lot of surrealist work uh, in, my, in my own painting uh, career. And um, uh, an optical illusion is always very intriguing. And it also is a very um, interesting uh, phenomenon to try, try to fool the eye. There's a nice French term for it. But anyway, that is beginning to look like it might be uh, acceptable as a um, as a well as a reflection or a sunset in this uh, in this um mirrored building. Down here is some something going on with, with things at the bottom. It is a little difficult to tell, but it also is a, um, the, uh, another interesting reflection of the tree itself is being reflected in this, uh, in this mirror. And it's, it, and it's in extremely dark tones and it's a little bit fragmented because there are, there are um, uh, squares uh, which are not exact uh, sharp mirrors. And so here we have, and you can see that I'm trying to uh, interpret the, um, the reflections of this tree. Uh, I, I, you have to agree that this is a rather interesting, um, interesting way of looking at a Christmas tree. And of course, the last thing that I'm going to do is to, with paints, uh, decorate it with the lights. Uh, hopefully, the, 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 uh, the um, paint will be set enough so that I can just uh, cover this tree with the brilliant little pinpoint lights, uh, which tells the whole story of this painting. Uh, there's a call. OK. Uh, hello, let me, uh, hello, let me take your call. Hello there. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, my name's Jonathan. Are I was you there? Wondering how do you, yes, some you, you do a lot of paintings. How do you, what criteria do you use to judge which, pol which paintings work better than others and the quality of each painting? Um, comparatively to one another. Which oh, yeah. ones are better than others and how oh, do you... Okay, I, I, I didn't catch your name. Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan. Well, that's a nice question. And it's also also a very difficult one to answer. Um, I believe that all sorts of elements have to go into the quality of a painting. To me, one of the most important qualities of a painting is the composition. And uh, naturally then following thereafter is the, uh, is the, is the use of color and the technique and the general originality of it. So, um, uh, oh, all right, well. Uh, uh, does, that have, does that sort of answer any kind of um, problem, uh, questions that you might have? Yeah, um, yeah, formally, so a lot of formal elements. Well, not necessarily formally. I think originality should have been a little bit higher on the list than what I said. Uh, color and everything uh, is, 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 is an element which is to be seriously considered, but I do believe that originality is the thing that, uh, that, that I'm always looking for in the quality of a painting. 
your, your, your paintings are very traditional, however. I'm a realist. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh yes, I am not an I am not an I'm not a modernist, and um, and I have been a realist my entire career. I have tried the other. It is interesting to me, and I don't believe that I do it very well. Do you paint, sir, Jonathan? Yes. Yeah. And are you a are you a uh, modernist? Yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a I'm a traditionalist as well. I'm a realist. Good. And I mean, good. That's wonderful. I mean, do you like it? Well, one of the, you know one of the basic things is you know not being contemporary or not. Not being, you know, avant-garde or yeah. not being, um, you know, one of one of my own, uh, you know, w w when I question my own work is whether it's whether it's uh, the quality of it, and also the, um, y you know, the originality of it and the uh, the fine art aspect and the high art rather than low art, crafty art. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right, Jonathan. I mean, the fact that you question all that means that you're a serious painter. And uh, I have no real answers to it. I can only tell you what my opinion is. Uh, I, I am drawn to paintings that have craftsmanship to them, uh, originality in, in concept, and then, of course, composition. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I know we could talk for four days about this. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's no I was just wondering, you know, because you know, when people ask me, you know, to judge my, to uh, defend my work, I like to, you know, because I like your work. I think it's very nice. Thank you. And I like that you keep your true to specific sites on Long Island. Yeah, right. Well, it's great fun, I think. Tell me, why do you have to defend your work, Jonathan? Uh, well, just, you know, to myself. And oh, to, to my yourself, peers, okay. And, you know. Yeah. Because and when, if I'm in school and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, during the critiques and... Yeah, well, if you, if you have to defend your work, tell them all to bug off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy all the time. Though. No, I realize that, but I mean, uh, just live long enough and you'll find yourself able to do that. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks for calling, Jonathan. It was neat questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ah. Ah. There's no, there's no accounting for how amazing the public is when it comes up with those really uh, intriguing and uh, vital questions. I have another call, good. Hello there, tell me who you are, please. Hello, Pat, my name is Neil. Yes, Neil. Uh, and uh, we've been watching you and been a fan of yours for quite a few years now and think your work is superb. Good, the more the merrier, good. And uh, hopefully we're gonna be getting into painting soon. We're putting a studio together. The reason I called tonight is my wife and I are both fascinated by the painting you did of the Japanese beetles and the roses. Ah, uh, where did you see that? We saw it on one of your earlier or previous shows. Oh, okay. And we've been absolutely obsessed with it since then. I was wondering, is it still around? Is oh, it available? It's, yeah, yeah, it's in Virginia. It is. Is yes. it for sale? Uh, sure. Wonderful. I will bring it the next time I come up in January. Okay, and where did you get the inspiration for it? I had to do a surrealist show for a gallery in New York, and uh, I, for me to explain to you how I ever got the, uh, the notion is um, probably as difficult as explaining the meaning of a dream. I don't know. I don't paint my dreams, but I think that painting grew. Uh, the concept started out as something entirely different, and as I was working on it, it seemed to change. So, uh, the Japanese beetles, I believe I called the painting Pearl Harbor. Yes, I remember you calling it that. Uh, because the Hawaiian Islands are five, uh, were called at one time the Roses of the Pacific. Ah. And um, uh, there were five roses in that painting, and then, uh, then I put some Japanese beetles on it. It turned out to be an homage to Pearl Harbor. It, well, we think it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, I don't know if it's out of line, but I'd like to know what size is it? How big is it? Uh, as I recall, I believe it's four feet by five feet. Okay. I think that's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a rather large piece. I could be wrong. I really, I really am very bad at remembering the size of pictures. How could I contact you to discuss uh, how one might go about purchasing it or how much you'd want for it? Well, uh, write to Judy. Uh, write to Judy. Tell her who you are, where the, what the address is. She'll forward the letter to me, the Judy here up at the Cablevision at 1600 Motor Parkway in Hopog. She will forward, forward the letter to me, and I will make sure to answer it pronto. Pat, thank you very, very much. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thanks and for calling. And your superb work. We love watching and we love seeing what you do. Thank you so much. Give me your name once more. It's Neil. Neil. I will remember that forever. Okay, Pat, And I'm expecting you. to hear from you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Neil. Right, good night. Bye-bye. Uh, here is the background uh, of the application of this tree. Uh, as you can see, I did the background for it first. 
I'm using a sort of a diluted, uh, deep uh, combination of colors. There's some ultramarine in here, there's some Van Dyke brown, and uh, the, uh, the whole thing is going to get done in a silhouette form. Good. Here's another call. I, I wish everybody in the, in the studio, in the uh, audience, could see what happens here when calls come through. A, uh, uh, um, uh, I must tell you, the uh, w the cameraman comes out from behind his camera, which is in the deep shadow, and he has a uh, headgear on with earphones and a microphone in front of his m mouth, and 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 then he makes hand signals um, like uh, like this, a phone call. So I, uh, so that's how I get to know that you're on the uh, on the phone. So he just did that. So who are you, please? Hello, hello. Ah, oh, after all that, they've gone. I hung up. Well, anyway, at least I was able to describe to you how I get the information that uh, somebody is on the air, because it's obvious I don't have a phone here, and um, it's being taken at the switchboard. And Judy is the lady to whom you write if you want any information about me or the paintings or anything. She is the... Um, Secretary par excellence of the cable easel and uh, does a lovely job as well as answer the phone tonight. Here uh, is an interpretive way of representing this tree. Uh, it uh, probably is um, more design, actually, than a literal uh, rendering of it. It, uh, it is, I showed you the shape of it when, when I laid the painting out, and uh, hopefully the uh, the addition of the uh, of the lights in a reasonably um, faithful pattern uh, of course the lights were put on and uh, some the, uh, the reason that they look so uh, hand done is because they are a little bit uh, askew somewhat a kill uh, uh, you know they're not they're not in exact kilter and like the po coast po the Christmas cards that you get the Christmas trees are always perfectly symmetrical and the lights are always perfectly spaced and that doesn't happen in real life and so I'll try to capture a little bit of the feeling of what this tree is 43 years ago Mr. De Gennaro planted this thing in his garden. Why he decided to cut it down and to allow it to be cut down for this particular event, I do not know the details of that. I don't think they really matter. The point is that uh, a fellow uh, that we know his name planted the tree. How many times does that happen? I'm sure that your Christmas tree was grown by somebody, but you don't know his name. Anyway, another call just uh, was signaled to me, and so I'll take that one. Hello there. Tell me your name, please. Hello, my name is Anna. Yes, Anna. And I am a great fan of yours. Good. <laughs> I love y you, your personality, and, oh. and the paintings are just gorgeous. Thank you. And I think it was the last taped show that you made that you had mentioned that you paint furniture. Yes, I do. And uh, I do it just as a kind of a hobby. Yes. And I do you know kind of a whimsical thing with bright colors. Yeah. Um, I would like to know how you prepare your furniture to be painted. There are many ways. Uh, did you say her name is Natalie? Anna. Oh, I'm sorry. Where did I get Natalie? Oh, well, never mind. Doesn't matter. You might have been called Natalie, but you weren't. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, there are many ways. Uh, one of the most, uh, one of the ways that is done in Europe is to paint on raw wood with water-soluble color. Water-soluble. Yeah, which, uh, which, which, which is either gouache or, or any water-based color. I mean, acrylics are probably the best things to use for that. They yeah. dye the wood, and it never comes off. Uh -huh. In other words, the, 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 the color sinks into the wood right. and becomes as permanent, I suppose, as anything on the planet. Uh -huh. The other one is to use household enamels and to paint with, how, with enamels, which is oil-based and turpentine-based, and um, then to coat it with um, uh, varnish. Uh, I like to use boat varnish. I'm not sure that I trust polyurethane. What was that that you use? What kind of varnish? Household varnish. Okay. Uh, oh, 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 uh, boat varnish. Boat. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, uh, because um, Valspar or an, any oil-based um, uh, varnish, uh, I, I'm really not very trustworthy, trusting of the uh, of the um, the new varnishes. I'm not sure if they will last or not yellow terribly. I see. So, um, Painting in oil-based colors on, on, on prepared wood, namely painted wood, is one way, and water-based colors on raw wood is another. I see. Okay. Um, if, you, if you want to and you need more details, I will make out a whole bunch of details and put them on a sheet and just write to Judy here and she will, uh, she'll send you the sheet. Oh, that's wonderful. Good. I love that. Fine. Okay, and All I'm right. so glad you're back and live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. Thank you. Well, thanks for calling, Anne. Uh, you're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> well, while we, were to, while we were doing all that, this great uh, dark mass 
took place, and it's time for a break because I just got si a signal from the deep shadows of the studio once again. And so let me take a break and see whether or not I really have to sort of evaluate whether I'm messing this up or doing it right. So I'll be right back. Again, I believe there's a phone call right away, so why don't I, why don't I just take it? Hello there. T Hello. Tell me who you are, please. Hi, oh, there's some music as well. Um, right. Is there a phone call? Yes. yes. Okay. Can we get it? Hello there. Hi, this yeah. is John. Yes. Uh, I have a question for my wife. We uh, like your show very much. Uh, she wants to know if it's important to title each painting and where uh, would you place the title and what manner? How would you print it up? Well, there are many different opinions about that. What's your name, please? John. Oh, yes, John. Uh, there are many opinions about that. I like to uh, title the paintings and give them a, a location. Uh, the uh, the uh, old people did that in the olden days, uh, way back in the 1400s. And I usually sign my pictures down on the lower right-hand corner, and with a very uh, small lettering technique, I uh, letter the place that it's from. I see. And, uh, but, but very, very small. It's like the smaller the initial on the Cadillac, the classier you are. All right. So in other words, you have it on the front, though, where it could be seen? Yes, it is a, absolutely a matter of choice uh, for the painter to do that. You can, and if you don't want to put it on the front of the painting because you may not uh, feel confident enough to let her so small in such a small space, then you can uh, notate it on the back. But I personally think it's essential to have the notation of where the place is, back or front, but to no question about it, to put it on. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for calling, John. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, I'm trying to give this building some shape with these windows. I don't want it to interrupt the interest of the tree. And then over here, there was some sort of a very mysterious kind of apparently a reflected cloud in this, uh, in this mirrored building. And that's why you kind of have to be a little bit careful of how you handle these things because they can be great blotches that are, uh, that are unexplainable uh, to the viewer. And the minute it's unexplainable to the viewer, you've got yourself a problem. Um, so here is the way I have prepared this particular um, uh, piece, which is, of course, looking very commercial at this point, but it also has a certain mystery to it, I think. Uh, let me take that other call. Hello there. Tell me who you are, please. Hi, this is Ed. Ed. Yes. The last time I talked to you, you were doing uh, a Halloween piece with yes. the ghost. Remember the ghost? I, I don't recall it at all. I do remember, uh, Ed. You were talking about the, uh, the white eggplant. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, I wanted to know, I heard there's um, some sort of a preparation or a spray that you can spray on your uh, paintings when they're finished so they won't, uh, how can I say, like discolor or something like that? Well, uh, it's not a question of discoloring. It's a question of protecting the oil because uh, paintings hang in places where there's grease 
no matter how pristine the environment, there's always a possibility of dust and grease, and so you varnish paintings. Varnish does come in spray cans, but the only thing to remember is do not spray them uh, for at least a year until they've dried. Yes, I know. Oil paintings take a long time. Too. Yeah. So, and you have to let the paint cure and settle and so on, but you, in fact, do um, uh, varnish them. Yes. Good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Bye-bye. Bye. I've just noticed in my monitor here that there's a reflection in this part, mirrored part of the building of the tree right over here. And so here's another opportunity to, uh, to, to, to play magical uh, uh, visual tricks. Uh, this tree is reflected smaller. I don't know why. I'm not even going to question it. But it is definitely reflected. So it's reflected twice. One in the shadow side of the building behind it and another one in the sunset, uh, sunlit side of the, of, the, uh, of the other side of the building. So um, once again, there are lovely things happening in a composition like this, uh, unexplainable uh, or mysterious, and um, that's, why, uh, that's why these things are attractive uh, to uh, the visual artist. I think that the, um, the Christmas season tends to be maybe a little bit uh, overcrowded with uh, the commercial, the tacky, the tawdry, the, uh, well, you know, in my opinion, not always a, an attractive uh, thing. I love the lights. I think the lights are wonderful, and I love putting lights up, and I love to see them on the trees and so on. But for the most part, uh, a lot of the decor tends to be a little bit, uh, a little bit nauseating, to be uh, very, very frank about it. And so uh, to do a painting of a Christmas tree requires maybe um, something else, and I'm hoping that this will do it. Anyway, the time is wearing out, and I think the time has come for the lights to get put on. Uh, the lines in the building, the, de the denoted as a building, can come later, but the point is to light this tree. And uh, the lighting of the tree is going to take place uh, right now with a very improvised uh, star. It has to be pure white because um, the, uh, that's the whitest p part of this picture. I'm going, to use some, I'm going to use some flake white, which is not the quick drying stuff, because because it will, um, it will, uh, 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 um, oh gosh, I can draw with it more easily because the, the uh, quick drying stuff is extremely stubborn and has a lot of pigment to it and you can't really get some nice, um, nice sharp lines. Anyway, the, the uh, stuff. Well, here we go. Uh, it, 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 there is a certain, um, a certain boredom that is going to take place when there is the repetition of movement. We all know that. But uh, let's just sort of pretend that um, our minds are up on, a, up, up on a ladder and we are decorating the tree with, uh, uh, well, the first color that we have are some of these little orange lights. And uh, at random, randomly selected, uh, maybe there are places that are not going to get more than others. And um, the fact that the background is so dark is what's going to make this able to be to work. If you hadn't, if I had not concentrated on the uh, the really almost truly silhouetted quality of the uh, of the background for this tree, there was no need to put branches. Branches were not visible anyway. It was the end of the day, and everything was pretty much turning into silhouette. And so the brilliance. Uh, there is no light without dark. That sounds like a philosophical question and remark, but it is um, it is extremely uh, scientific. That uh, without darkness, you will not be able to find brilliant light. Another call. Good. Hello there. Tell me who you are, please. Hello. My name is Anne. Yes, Anne. Uh, I just wanted to tell you, Miss Windrow, I have been enjoying your shows for many years. Great. I live in Florida. I moved there about eight years ago, and I come back twice a year to see my family. And uh, one year, I was back, and I saw you on television. And my sister tapes every one of your shows and sends them to me in Florida. Bless her little heart. Yes. <laughs> That's my sister, Pat. Wow. And I want to tell you, it's just been such a pleasure, and you're such an inspiration. <laughs> and so I have taken up painting, and I must say that I do, I am able to sell a few. Well, is, are you using some of my uh, techniques? Yes. And Wonderful. I find that your uh, landscapes of Long Island are wonderful for me to try and translate into the Florida landscape. Yes, yes, right, right. So that I really, I just want to tell you how much I enjoy watching you. Well, thank goodness you called, Anne. I never would have known it if you hadn't. Uh, yes, and, and I wish we could have you in Florida so everybody could enjoy you, Dad. Well, where are you in Florida? I live in a place called Palm Coast. Aha. Uh -huh. 
which is on the East Coast, just south of St. Augustine. Oh, okay. That's a lovely part. Yes, it is. It's very nice. Well, I tell you, you know, it's difficult to get things syndicated. If somebody is watching the show and knows how to do that, uh, I am ready, willing, able, and ready to ready to do it. Uh, but I find that I'm I'm just not capable to to figure out how to get this thing syndicated so that it would go further afield than it does. I should call one of my local public service. Um stations down there and tell her about well, it. Well, if you did, you would be uh, probably doing yourself uh, a service and possibly even the cable easel might find its way south. Oh, that would be wonderful. Good, Anne. I, I'm in your hands. Thank you. Uh, a, an appointed uh, promotion agent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for calling. And I hope someday to get to Virginia to see you in Virginia. In Please do. Place. I'm right in Front Royal and I'm the only game in town. Okay. Good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, you see... <clears throat> Uh, uh, you, you think that you're reaching only the locals, but you wind up that the locals are, um, are doing, the, uh, doing the job that I was hoping they'd do, and that is to tape these things and send them farther afield. I'll bet, I'll bet Anne's heart just skips a beat when she sees these, um, these Long Island landscapes coming down to her, to her house in Florida. Well, we're getting somewhere, I think. Uh, the, time is, uh, the time, of course, uh, uh, flies. Uh, as usual, but um, the tree is getting done, and I'm hoping that uh, in in a few moments I can kind of give you some scale. Another phone call about the size of this tree. Obviously, it's a very big one. Let me take that call. Hello there. Tell me your name, please. Uh, Becca. Yes, Becca. Um, yes, I just wanted to know how uh, the size of your brush. If you use the same size throughout the whole painting. Oh no, I use many different size brushes. Uh, what size brush did you use for the Christmas tree? Not decoration, just like the outline of it. That was a big one. It um, well, it was a sort of a big one. It's written right here. I think it's a number. It's a number ten. A uh, square cut uh, pig bristle. It's uh -huh. not one of those uh, soft sables that I usually use. Uh -huh. But um, you have to have a brush that is going to come to a point. Uh -huh. And uh, when when I when I did this tree. So um, if you can, you either use the flat side of a flat brush mm -hmm. or you use a round that comes to a point. Why do you ask? Are you painting? Um, yes, I'm trying to do what you're doing right here. I think it's a beautiful painting. You're, you're, you're painting as I paint? Yes. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I watch you all the time. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's the point of this program. I didn't know that anybody really ever did it. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for calling. Bye. -bye. Bye. Keep your brushes clean and don't eat when you're working. Uh, it's very tempting to have a glass of something or a, or a candy bar or something right near you when you're working, but it's a not a good idea. It's also a very good idea to have the window slightly open because um, paints have fumes and they're not good. And uh, I, uh, I think that most people who, who paint probably know that, but there's nothing like repetition to make it a point. Uh, we're coming on to the uh, new year. I suppose any, everybody who, uh, who lives with a calendar on their desk knows that. And my one wish is that, uh, that you not drive and drink uh, on this uh, final holiday of the year, just so that I know that I can be assured that my audience will remain the same size as it is and possibly also get bigger. So um, I don't know why I take it upon myself to, uh, to say these things and try to give advice to people's behavior, but I really am distressed when I, when I know that a big holiday is coming and that uh, statistically a lot of people are going to uh, wind up in a bad situation. So my wish to you is not only Happy New Year, but also, uh, for heaven's sakes, don't drink and drive at the same time. Well, the yellow, the red, the orange, some, uh, some white has gone on, some pale yellow has gone on, and, uh, well, there, no, that's not too bad. It looks somewhat like it. I better put some on the ends, uh, just because some, some guy got out there with the uh, teetering on the ladder to put those, those lights way on the edge of the, of the branches, and anybody who's decorated their own tree knows that you do, in fact, teeter some when you try it. Uh, I think lights are my favorite part of this holiday season. I really, I really get very, uh, very inspired when I see the lights. As if anybody has ever been in New York uh, at any time of year and seen the Tavern on the Green, uh, the lights
lights of those trees is, is, is truly a, um, a feat, uh, an accomplishment. It's just, it's just amazing. And you can also see that from 30,000 feet um, when you're in a plane. The uh, tavern on the green is visible at 30,000 feet, believe it or not. Well, the final, the final ones are going to be the white ones. Those are going to be the most bright of all. And uh, let, let, me, let me show you, in comparison, and now that all the other colors are on, how, how effective pure white is when you get it against a dark background and you can compare it to the other colors. You'll, I think you'll notice with this uh, close-up how absolutely brilliant uh, the pure white out of a tube becomes. Uh, so it's all a color lesson as well as uh, fun to, uh, to talk about this tree and to tell you about it and to hope that you go and visit it because it truly is an enormous tree. And um, uh, anybody who lives near New York has seen Rockefeller Center, but maybe not everybody has seen this one in Uniondale. So uh, by all means, if you can, uh, fight the traffic, get in the car, and uh, plan to go and visit Long Island's uh, only uh, official Christmas tree. Uh, I'm going to try to, down here in the shadows, give you some idea of the scale of this tree. And the only way that that can truly be done is by uh, assuming that everybody knows the size of a human being or the approximate size of a human being. And so to be able to show you the uh, proportion of this tree, the, rather than to say this was just a little 10-foot tree with a very small building behind it, uh, I'm, going to put a, I'm going to put a human in there. <clears throat> well, I, I, you know, I could keep, keep this on until we close the show, and perhaps I will. But in the meantime, I would like to get what I just talked about in there. There is, um, every once in a while, on the monitor, a human being uh, walks towards the tree or past it and um, is in a sort of a little, little shadowy color. And this is approximately the size <coughs> of a human being next to that tree. Uh, I think that, let me, let me, let me get this all <coughs> sort of um, uh, toned in here so that uh, you will be able to see what I'm talking about. I'm uh, not putting the fence around the tree. First of all, there's no need for it and it's a little bit getting a little bit late. I just want to um I just want to have another a little short lesson on proportion. I talk about it a good deal of the time, and this is an opportunity to, to tell you how proportion matters uh, <clears throat> when you're doing anything that involves size. Uh, many times paintings fail because there has not been an understanding of the proportion of things uh, or things relating to others. Uh, the relationship of the people on this painting <coughs> here uh, it, it can, be, um, can be shown to you with just the, only the very slightest suggestion that somebody is walking past this tree in a little sort of a gray tone and, um, uh, and with this person may be a child. So here is, here is a, a, a sort of a, just, a, just an insinuation that the size of this tree is right here. Here is the, here is the general proportion. A lot of people walked by it, uh, but uh, close to it, they're approximately this size. Anyway. Well, as I said to you earlier, my advice for, the, uh, for spending New Year's is to jolly well be sure that you uh, don't drink and drive. And the other one is, to, is that I wish you, uh, well, I wish everybody, um, uh, you know, great things to happen in the coming years. Uh, down where I'm living, there seems to be uh, an event that is going to change our lives forever. Mr. Disney has decided that he is going to open up a theme park 25 minutes away from where I live. Um, and that can either be great fun or a great disaster. I'm not quite sure. I'm beginning to wonder. Uh, and uh, I will keep you posted. I will be your news uh, maker of the, Disney, of the Disney project on this program. Every month, it's going to take them five years to do it. And so um, you will be kept abreast of it through me. Uh, then, of course, if it does take place, and it looks like it will, uh, I will be in front row waiting for all you exhausted Disney visitors to come by and see me at the gallery, which means that I may be swamped um, by, uh, by 1996 uh, or seven, whenever they plan to open, by the incredible multitudes they are expecting anywhere between 12 million people a month. So uh, swallow that one if you possibly can. And I'm exactly 25 minutes away from there. Anyway, we've gotten the little people as a suggestion of what, they, of what the size is uh, lurking down there in the shadows of this tree. And the only thing really probably to, uh, to come up with now is the, um, 
is the interpretation, certainly not the architectural rendering, of the glass in this building. I'm not sure that I can really do this satisfactorily, so, but I'm, I'm going to try and I'm going to show you what happens when you do, in fact, apply these lines uh, of the building. Uh, it, it will no longer be the kind of background that you think it is with that glow. It may tell you that this is, in fact, a mirrored building uh, in which there's a reflection. Good. Another call. Fine. Hello there. Your name? Laurie? Yeah, Laurie. How you doing? Fine. Um, can you tell me what color paint you're using on the Christmas tree? You mean the dark color? Right. It, well, it was a cr combination of ultramarine, right. al uh, alizarin crimson, and Van Dyke brown. Oh, okay. And it made a really dark, rich color. Okay. Thank you. Are you doing it, Laurie? No, I'm not. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked anyway. I just, I want to do it, and I wanted to know what color it was. Fine, fine. Well, any dark color all combined is probably going to give you the richest color that you can get. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. So here I am, I am attempting to interpret uh, uh, with uh, my trusty number six uh, sable um, brush with paint reduced down to a very thin consistency to try to uh, show the lines of this building. They do not become dark uh, in the, uh, in the, it's the separation of the glass, obviously. They, they do not become dark as it crosses the, uh, the sunset. They remain light. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, they do. So uh, who's to question? But here is, uh, hopefully, uh, the explanation of what these, of what these squares are. And uh, if, if it works, then fine. If it doesn't, we just, have to, uh, we just have to chalk it up to my inexperience and my inability to translate what I see onto canvas. But um, anyway, it is a noble experiment on my part, I think. You have to be a fool to do this in public and take a chance of making mistakes, but then, uh, you, you know the world can suffer a fool once in a while, and uh, here we have. Let me let me let me start to show the the turn of the building is done by these lines. So the, let's let's assume that this line is going to be in this perspective, coming up and around, and it will turn and then it will go down. So let's say that the building turns that way. The optical illusion hopefully is working. Um, you can, of course, do this. You can take a camcorder. If anybody had any sense and gave you a camcorder at Christmas time, you can do the pull the same trick and uh, try to work and uh, take your time at it. Um, for me to think that I can do this in an hour is because I'm 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 bound to. There are certain uh, there are certain you know requirements for this program. You do it, and um, uh, but I, I do believe that uh, the uh, the pe people who want to paint and want to try and you know sort of get launched on this kind of a technique can do it uh, by using their own uh, video recording machine. And uh, that uh, that probably is uh, probably one of the better lessons that you'll, than you'll ever get. Um, uh, and I've and I've opened the way. This is an innovation. I don't believe in any other show on the air is doing what we're doing here at uh, Cablevision. In the meantime, January is coming. I will be up here at the end of January. I'm thinking that I'm going to probably maybe uh, cut down on coming up every month during the winter time. It's a very long ride and the weather sometimes spooks me. And so I will certainly do the January one, but it's possible that I will not see you then again until uh, March, uh, giving me February to uh, pursue what I'm doing. I'm preparing a show in my gallery called The Shenandoah Valley. And I'm going to produce uh, somewhere around 20 or 25 paintings of the valley and the mountains around me and have a show opening in the spring. So that's the plan. If anybody wonders how painters work it, we plan. We, at least we try to. And uh, that's my plan. And you're the first one to know. Now, the perspective of this building is beginning to change as it comes down. It, uh, it, uh, and the optical illusion is that it is uh, getting uh, more to eye level. Um, I'm probably going to regret that I did this in front of you, but um, so be it. Let me also tell you that um, the, uh, the, uh, my visit to Riverhead this morning was just wonderful. Um, I went and I met with, um, with a certain uh, Victor 
uh, and a certain uh, uh, ray, and uh, I've been commissioned to do a portrait of one of the uh, one of the uh, presidents of the Suffolk County uh, Federal Savings Bank, and that should be uh, a very interesting project. These people are self-made people, and they are uh, running a, a rather lovely little establishment out there, and in a an enchanting part of the world. Riverhead is the county seat. I'm sure that everybody knows that, and a lot of things take place out there, including the following. Um, horsemanship, uh, horse farms, vineyards, um, uh, tremendous uh, potato farms, not as big as they used to be, but uh, the eastern end of the island has a uh, has a legacy all its own. It's got nooks and crannies of wonderful uh, scene, scenery, wonderful waterways. Uh, of course, there is at the end there is Orient Point on one on one fork, and there is. Um, Montauk on the other, and then that uh, remarkable thing called the Atlantic Ocean, which, uh, of course, I miss a great deal in the mountains. The Atlantic Ocean is a uh, is a uh, is a. Uh a particularly favorite ocean of mine. The Pacific is too cold and it's too far away. So I really love the Atlantic Ocean and the fact that it it laps on the shores of Long Island makes it an even better place. So here is some here is uh here is once again uh the attempt to uh to show you and I think that maybe my, my lines of the building will probably have to be corrected if I if I were to uh put this ever on display for sale uh in the springtime event which we call Art for Open Lands. I will probably try to correct some of of this um, some of this perspective on the building, either that or scumble it and make it a little bit less brilliant. Uh, yes, oh, another call. Okay, hello. Tell me who you are, please. Hi, I'm Karen. Yes, Karen. Um, what what are you painting on? I'm painting on a canvas board. Oh, you are. Yeah. Um, is that hard to paint on? No. Well, I mean, it's hard to paint, period. It doesn't matter if you paint on a board or a canvas or a sheet or a piece of paper. Uh, but, I mean, it it reacts very nicely. It's resisting. It uh, you can't puncture a hole in it. Ah. Uh, it and it has very a pretty. I like it a lot. Well, it has a nice uh, linen surface, and it's inexpensive. That's good. So it has everything going for it. Ah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Glad you called. Okay. Bye. Bye. So here we have the final uh, bunch of, um, and, and I'm hoping that this uh, um, that this um, begins to make a little bit of sense. Here's some more of these pr perspective lines on these windows. Uh, Perspective is something that you have to be very concerned with when you're doing architectural drawings because there's really nothing more annoying than seeing a painting of a building and it looks like the building is about to fall over. So uh, let's see how the, these things straighten out rather quickly here. They become at eye level, and there is that reflection of the tree with the with the window separations going right over it, and that'll tell you it's a reflection. Of course, the reflection has got bright lights on it too, which I haven't put in yet. Anyway, this was a difficult thing to do, but it was uh, it was a challenge, which is what I'm usually uh, what, I, what I'm usually playing at, and it was also a way of being able to talk to you about the Christmas season and about uh, the coming events. So here are the little people down below. Uh, over here, there is some sort of bright, shiny things that are taking place, and they're probably car lights or car, the reflections of of, of of lights in cars, and. Um, uh, more than likely uh, mysterious things that uh, that you really can't decipher, and it doesn't really matter. All they, all you know is that there's something something going on here, which is uh, which has caught the light. So, anyway, one minute before only put the lights on in the reflection of the of the of the tree in the other window. That's um, that's another little uh, another little thing that uh, can possibly explain some of the uh, some of the uh, mysteries of this painting. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, thank you for watching. Uh, it certainly is always um, it's a it's a real uh, th thing to get up here. I can tell you it's a seven hour ride back and forth. No, well, it's a seven and a half hour ride to get there and seven and a half hours to get home. However, I wouldn't have it any other way. And uh, thanks for watching. It was all extremely enlightening to me to see all this taking place. And I have just noticed once again on the monitor that the reflection of the tree in the sunset side of the building also has lights in it. So the more you look at something, the more you learn. Uh, thank you for uh, being such a devoted audience and for all those nice calls. Uh, I'll see you in uh, January. And at that point, we may be completely up to our kneecaps in snow. Bye-bye. See you again.